That was a blessing to my heart. Thank you very, very, very much. I remember, of course, that today is what is traditionally called Palm Sunday. And so I want to bring a message basically dealing with the cross of Jesus Christ. I know it's the Sunday that is assigned his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. But uh, next Sunday we're going to be with the resurrection and the cross will have taken place in between. So I want to basically go to the cross of Jesus Christ today and I trust that it might be a blessing to you. Because it was at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. I'd like to invite you to turn with me in the Bible to a couple of scriptures. First of all, my actual text verse, Galatians chapter number 6 and verse number 14. Again, that is Galatians chapter number 6 and verse number 14. I do, for context sake, wish to begin my reading in verse number 12. There the Bible says, As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. And then I would also like to invite you to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, where we will read some verses concerning the cross. First of all, in verse number 17, the Apostle Paul stated, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. And go down to verse number 21. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. And then please, verse number 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Now I want to read verses 1 through 5 of chapter number 2 also. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. 
For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Note verse number 5. That your faith should, stand, should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And again, I want to read Galatians 6.14, where the Bible says, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. When I think of this phrase, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, I am reminded that I just read some things that we're to glory in. For instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse number 31, the Bible says that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So we have here our Lord. And, of course, from 6.14 of Galatians, we have the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, please, if I may, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is interesting for me to note also that in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, the Apostle Paul spoke of something else to glory in, and strangely enough, might seem somewhat of an oddity, somewhat of a paradox, but here it is in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, and I'm just going to read verses 9 and 10. After getting a thorn in the flesh, and after having besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from him, God told Paul that his grace was sufficient for him. This comes in verse number 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now note carefully, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That, of course, is opposite to the world's kind of thinking, but this is what Paul wanted because he had respect unto the recompense of the reward, as it were. He looked further down the road than the end of his nose. He saw heaven ahead and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he realized that it was only one life would soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. But he also realized that if anything gets done for Christ, it's going to have to be done by the power of Christ, operative in and through the believer. And so he said, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Why? Why? What was his reasoning? That the power of Christ may rest upon him. Now, there's one more thing to glory in that I want to call your attention to before I get into the body of my message. And this comes from Jeremiah chapter number 9, a passage that many of you are familiar with. And I will read verses 23 and 24. A careful admonition from the Lord. 
an awesome warning from the Lord. Verse 23 of Jeremiah chapter 9 states, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches. And again, may I be so tedious as to remind you to carefully note verse number 24. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Well, ultimately, all of this comes back to glorying, I should say, in the Lord. And for today, our specific purpose is to think about glorying in the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As is stated in Galatians chapter number 6, verse 14 again, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom I am crucified unto the world, and the world is crucified unto me. Whenever I read that last part of the verse, I have a tendency to think to myself, at least that's the way it's supposed to be. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I am crucified unto the world. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't love the people in the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. But it does mean that we do not love the ways of the world that are basically energized by the great tempter, that old serpent called Satan, Lucifer, the devil. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that is our subject today. Now, whenever the idea is used, save in the cross, and including that passage from 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, where the Apostle Paul told them that he didn't want to come with the great oratory that man would consider profound, but that he wanted it to be in the power of God. And he mentioned the cross being foolish to the world, but unto us which are saved, the wisdom of God and the power of God Whenever I think of the cross in that vein, I have to say that by cross, we're using it as a kind of symbol. We're using it in kind of an emblematic way. Whenever I say, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross, I think I can safely state that we are talking about the entire program of the Lord Jesus Christ that brought about the redemption of mankind. I think I can safely say that I'm talking all the way from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. I believe that I am right in saying that it would go from Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 15, where our Lord spoke in the vein of the seed of the serpent bruising the heel of the seed of the woman, but the seed of the woman, which obviously is none other than Jesus Christ our Lord, bruising the head of Satan's seed, and that begins the program of the redemption of our soul 
in and through the work of Jesus Christ, beginning back in Genesis and winding up in Revelation chapter number 20 and verse number 10, where the Bible says that that old serpent was cast into hell fire forevermore. And in Genesis, or pardon me, Revelation chapter 22 and verse number 17, where the Bible says the last invitation of the Bible, please, the spirit and the bride say come, and let him that heareth say come, and let him that is athirst come, and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. Now how can that be? How can this entire program of the redemption of sinful man be? Since God is holy and just and righteous, and since God is of purer eyes than to even behold evil, how can this redemption come about? Well, I would like to remind us, if I may, the scenario in which before the foundation of the world was ever laid in Genesis chapter number 1 and verse number 1, God knew all along that he was going to create man. God knew all along that man was going to sin in the Garden of Eden and that the wages of sin is death. God knew all along that that was not only the first death but the second death which is eternal death and hell fire forevermore. God knew all along that he had a plan for redeeming man. He had a plan for the forgiveness of sin. He had a plan for the rebirth of man, as it were. He had a plan whereby a man could be born again. He had a plan whereby the corruptible could put on incorruption and the mortal could put on immortality. He had a plan whereby sin could be washed away. He had a plan whereby man could be seen not in his own filth, but in the 100% pure righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. God had a plan whereby man could be shifted from the road to hell to a home in heaven. God had a plan whereby man could have the old wiped away and the new man come in. God had a plan whereby if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. God had a plan whereby one day the trumpet could sound and the voice of God could say, Come up hither. He had a plan whereby he could say in the very last chapter of the Bible, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come and take of the water of life freely. God had a plan whereby there could be that spring of living water whereby a man could freely come as he was and put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. God had a plan. I am reminded of a television show that used to be a few years ago. Probably is going to date me now just a little bit. But it was called The A-Team. Now my favorite synonym for television is television. But be that as it may, I used to watch The A-Team. 
I'm not recommending you watch it. I have, I don't know how many years it's been since I've watched any more than two, two or three minutes of television at a time. But I used to watch the A-Team. I can't remember all about those guys. But I do remember one thing one of the head guys said. Uh, he, and, and it was, and anybody here ever watched the A-Team? Okay, well then, <clears throat> we're guilty together, I guess. <laughs> that head guy, whoever he was, he would say, I love it when a plan comes together. Do you remember that one? Seems to me like he said it every time 18 came on. I can't remember when it came on or the deal, but I remember that phrase, I love it when a plan comes together. And of course they had all of these kinds of way outlandish, impossible plans that came together almost like magic. They'd work their stuff out. And it always went their way. Did you ever notice that? Always went how they planned it out. I suspicioned it was pre-planned out, kind of like a lot of politics is. Well, let me put it this way. God had a plan for the redemption of mankind. And that plan all came together at Calvary where Jesus died on the cross for our sin. Rose again the third day for our justification. Is it any wonder Paul said, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because you see, he wasn't just speaking of the cross. He was talking about that whole plan of God. But it was at the cross where Jesus took our sin on him. It was at the cross where Jesus paid for our sin. It was at the cross where they nailed him. It was at the cross where they spat upon him. It was at the cross where they put the crown of thorns there. It was at the cross of Calvary where Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It was at the cross of Calvary where he said, It is finished. The redemption of mankind. It was at the cross where the plan came together. And in this... I observed just four simple things quickly. First of all, I noticed that in 1 Corinthians, please, chapter number 1 and verse number 17, we have the word gospel brought to our attention. Gospel is actually a Greek word meaning uh, good news. It could be applied to several different things. And yet it has become so unique and so revered and so reverent that we know whenever the word gospel is used, it is bringing up that which was done now 2,000 years ago at Calvary. The gospel is also explained to us in the 15th of 1 Corinthians where the Apostle Paul said, I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then, of course, after that, he gives this business about that he was seen of 
Cephas, then of the eleven, then of above five hundred brethren at one time, then of James and of the twelve, and last of all he was saying of me also, Paul was speaking of himself there, as of one born out of due season. So he gave the empirical evidence or the proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. But whenever I think of the cross of Jesus Christ, I must inevitably think of the what? Gospel. Jesus died for my sins. What is the cross anyway? Was it a mistake? Was it a fluke of history? What happened? The plan came together at the cross. God was in control. God was hanging there on the cross. God was taking our sin upon him. No much wonder I love that song. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. I couldn't get it out. But he washed it white as snow. And another thing I observe here as I think of glorying in the cross is in 1 Corinthians the Apostle Paul says that the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish or to them that are lost or to them that are without Jesus Christ or to the unbelievers the cross and the preaching of the cross is foolishness. I am reminded to myself that, what do you think of this? You might want to consider it some. But as a minister of the gospel, I am not appointed to prove the gospel of the cross. I am appointed just to preach it. Not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Because it's got to be the Spirit of God that opens the spiritual understanding of a person. Now I'll be truthful with you, having done what many might consider at least some extensive study about all the things concerning Jesus Christ and the cross, about all the things concerning creation, about all the things concerning the flood. I've got to admit to you, to me, the evidence is all there. It's kind of like I was talking to Sarah the other day about the ark and that picture I've got. Of, you can see the bow of it sticking out of Mount Air right there. You can talk to unbelievers until you're blue in the face. But I used the expression the other day, you may recall, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Now, Second Peter chapter number 3, verse number... For I believe it is, says, For this they willingly are ignorant of. You see, a lot of people do not want to believe in Jesus Christ. A lot of people are prejudiced. They accuse us of being prejudiced. <laughs> They're prejudiced and they will not take the facts. They will not look at it objectively. No, they will not do it. Their mind is made up. Don't confuse them with the facts. And you can talk until you're blue in the face and not get anywhere. But let me give you this. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword 
piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And that's why some people get so mad when you start to talk to them about the things of the Lord. Because the old Lord, the Lord goes to working on their old heart. And boy, they're trying to fight against it. Energized by whom? The devil. So I see this. Paul said, I know it's foolishness to a bunch of those guys up there at Athens on Mars Hill. I know the preaching of the cross. Now, a lot of guys died on crosses. So the telling of the cross of this guy or that guy wouldn't be foolishness to most guys. It's like a lot of fairy tales are not foolishness to the atheist. But boy, they'll fight against the things of Jesus Christ. I am reminded of Shakespeare. That's some good stuff. It's one of the reasons why I've always been considered somewhat strange. I actually liked a lot of Shakespeare in school. One thing I remember Shakespeare said was, Methinks he doth protest too much. Now I observe that Paul warned us, I know the preaching of the cross. What cross? Any cross? No! The cross of Christ! What's it talking about? The plan, man, that came together at Calvary, whereby God loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's what's foolishness to him. Or you can talk to him about the thief that was crucified there. That doesn't upset. That doesn't get anything going. You can talk about the row of crucifixions that led out of Rome day after day after day after day and day. And not going to stir up anything. But it's Christ that makes the difference. It's always that God-man that makes the dividing line one side or the other. And I wish to hurry here just a little bit to pass some of this stuff up a little bit if I may. I notice that Paul uses the word preach. Did you guys notice that when I was reading? In fact, he uses it um, three times here in 1 and 2 of 1 Corinthians. The preaching of the gospel, I preach, etc., etc. I think it is right that we who believe the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I think it is right that we who believe the Bible just keep on preaching it just keep on preaching it with your life. Just keep on preaching it with your mouth when you get the chance. Just live it. That'll be con condemnation enough. And usage enough of the Holy Spirit of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Paul said, I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm not going to do it with all of the flowery language that Paul could dream up. And Paul knew how to or, uh, make an oration. Did he not? Read Acts 17. The brilliance of the Athenian address cannot be improved upon, brothers and sisters. Oh, Paul knew how to use oratory all right. But Paul said, now i got to get out of the way here because if they're really going to be converted, they've got to be converted by Jesus Christ, not by me. And it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. 
And one more thing here I want to observe. He did say to the lost, it's foolishness. But he also said that to the saved, it's the, and I just want to use one phrase, the power of God. You see, folks, I'll go back to this. The plan all came together at Calvary. Years I spent in vanity and pride, knowing not my Lord was crucified. The plan all came together at Calvary. And so we have, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross. And to close, I want to make mention of this again. That it's not just any cross. When we use the word cross, come on, we know what we're talking about. And so does the world out there. Because the difference is always in Jesus Christ our Lord. The Lord makes the difference. Praise God for that. To show that I, I, I just want to use this and I know that it's something that almost can't be explained, but in the back of the mind, I think a lot of you will get it. I had a professor in my early college days, and he had a niece who had a friend who was a young Jewess. And they had built a new synagogue yonder in Tennessee and this niece of my professors was interested in seeing it. And so the friend of my professor's niece was glad to take her and show her that synagogue. To make the long story short, the niece got around to asking the young Jewish, why, why don't you uh, sacrifice anymore. Now I know we could spend all day talking theological about all this stuff. This is going to reduce it to a simple area anyway. Why, why don't you have the sacrifices anymore like you used to have? Now right or wrong, like it or not, good or bad, here's what the young Jewess had to say to my professor's niece. Oh, I don't know. Ever since that man died, nothing's been the same. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out who she meant when she said ever since that man died. I will say this, since that man died, nothing has been the same. Because the pivotal point of all of history is yonder at Calvary. Have you been to Calvary? The Lord wants to save you if you're not saved. Now, He did all the work for you, the one thing he asks of you is to put your faith and trust and give your heart to him. There is something you have to do. You don't you just automatically come saved. You have to get saved. Unless you die before the age of accountability.
And so I invite you, if you're here today and you're not saved, I'd like to invite you to meet me down here at the front or take a position over at the door to my right. And a counselor will come and show you out of the Bible in the inquiry room how to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you're here and you are saved, you might feel led of the Lord just to come to the altar and pray and thank God for your salvation. Maybe you need to do some glorying in the cross of Jesus Christ today. I know one thing. God help us to forbid our glorying save in the cross of Christ. May we stand. I'm going to be baptizing Misha. God bless you, Misha. Would you go to prepare to pray for the baptism? It'll be a few minutes before I get up there, but God be with you. And I want to invite you folks, as I pray, to pray within your own heart. May God bless you to know and do His will. Our Father in heaven, I thank you for thy love and goodness. Lord, I thank you that we have this entire thing all the way from the beginning down through the end. Well, there won't be an end because of eternity. We have it all because of Christ. Now, coming together at the cross. Oh God, I pray thee to now speak to hearts as only you can. Have thy will and thy way. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Number 505 in the book. If you